amusement parks and water rides. We all remember the thrill and fun of those moments, don't we? You get excited and you're getting ready to get on that ride. And then you see this. <laughs> you get so frustrated and you're upset that you can't get to your ride fast enough. Heck, sometimes you don't even get to it at all. And in most occasions, you end up leaving it and finding something else to do. What about at the airport? When you're waiting in line to check in your bags or to go through security. I remember I was personally agitated not once, not twice, but a number of times as I waited in an unbelievably long line that was moving extremely slowly to check in my bag. This is what our healthcare system over here feels like. Now, I want you to take a second and imagine this. After analyzing our healthcare system over here, it has become evident that we are facing a number of challenges. One of those challenges includes long waiting times in hospital emergency departments. This has been a persistent issue since 1989, before I was even born, and before most of you over here were even born. I have heard of horror stories in hospitals' emergency departments due to long waiting times, overcrowded hospitals, and an outdated healthcare system. I have personally experienced one of these stories, but mine isn't even that traumatic. Let me tell you of a story of a Jamie Lee ball. Jamie Lee walked into Brampton Civic Hospital with excruciating abdominal pain. Apparently, that wasn't enough to get her the medical attention that she needed. She had to collapse on the floor and scream in pain in order to get some medical attention, which was actually translated to putting her on a gurney in the middle of the corridor, where she laid there for five days, unable to eat or drink, as she waited for her test results to come in, which eventually diagnosed her with internal bleeding. Five days. Imagine having to lie down on a bed in the middle of a hallway with nothing but a curtain that covers you and a sign that says, hallway patient number one. Jamie Lee compared her sleepless nights to a war scene, where she became one of a number of groaning patients who lined up the corridor with nothing that covers them but a piece of cloth. And I think to myself, what if that was me? Lying down there in pain with no one capable of helping. In another case in British Columbia, 56 year old Mary Lou Murphy walked into a hospital complaining of chest pain. She was given some morphine and told to go home. Later that night, Mary passed away. Reports indicated that she was assessed in a rush. In yet another case in Halifax, 68-year-old Jack Webb spent over six hours on a gurney. An aging, dying man was forced to endure unbearable conditions until he got some medical attention. He was later bumped out of his private room by another patient as he overheard medical staff saying, if he stops breathing, don't resuscitate. Guess what? A couple of days later, Jack passed away. During that month alone, the emergency department of that hospital announced special code census alerts on 23 out of 30 days, indicating that the hospital was unsafe due to overcrowding. And this doesn't just happen in that hospital alone. It actually happens in a number of hospitals across Canada. Hospitals are becoming overcrowded and they're definitely understaffed. People's hard-earned tax dollars that are supposed to be spent on healthcare should be capable of providing them with the basic necessities. But the problem goes way beyond hospitals. They can only do with whatever resources they have, right? So why don't we take a step back and try to understand where the problem originates from and why we seem to be doing worse than other developed countries and we seem to be suffering from this problem while well, they are not, or at least not as much. Our healthcare system is tied within the public sector, 
And in order to implement a change, there are so many layers that you need to penetrate. And it follows such a bureaucratic approach that it's almost impossible to crack open. A Waterloo medical company has been trying to implement its technology in Canadian hospitals, but has been faced with immense resistance. Meanwhile, in the U.S., they've already implemented their technology in over a thousand surgical procedures. Over there, they have systems in place that allow them to adapt to change fast enough. Over here, there's a very slow movement to support startups to disrupt the healthcare system, which is actually locked into a model from the 60s, trying to deliver modern healthcare while being constrained with a number of outdated systems. And as a result, we know we're going to face obstacles. Therefore, when it comes to disruption in healthcare, we always turn a blind eye towards solving our problems. Therefore, we end up being reactive and not proactive. We end up not challenging the status quo. We end up not defying convention. Now, let me walk you through the process that a patient usually faces when they walk into an emergency department. They have to get into the emergency department, wait for around six hours in order to see a general practitioner for roughly five minutes, who in most cases ends up referring them to a specialist where they have to book an appointment to see that specialist. And that usually takes one to two months before they see the specialist for around 20 minutes. And then the specialist is going to ask them to run some tests, which takes another one to two months of waiting before waiting for another month to book an appointment with the same specialist to understand what the ailment is. Think about this. Five months. Five months just to know what the problem is. It is unbelievable that we're living in the 21st century in a first world country, and it has to take so long to understand what the ailment is, and they will then wait for another five to six months in order to solve the problem. So how do we address this issue? Some people think that the problem lies in simple supply and demand, and that if we have more hospitals, more physicians, and more rooms, we will be able to overcome these challenges. And that's a fair assumption to make. With more hospitals and more physicians, patients would be looked after quicker. With more rooms, the Jamie Lees of Canada would not have to suffer. But in my opinion, this is a limited view. And there's a flip side to this argument. Another take on this lies in innovation. Rather than doing more of the same, we can actually do better with one hospital bed or one room rather than more beds and more rooms. Everything used to be inaccessible and centralized. But now we're living in an era where everything has become accessible. Think about this. With entertainment, we started with theaters, then we moved on to Blockbuster, and then, as most of you have guessed it, Netflix came in and rendered Blockbuster and most theaters used. Transportation. We started off with horse-drawn carriages, then we moved to cars, and then airplanes, which made every point on this planet accessible. Education. Started off with homeschooling, colleges and universities, and then Khan Academy and the like, making education accessible to everyone. Now, since we're talking about healthcare, let's rewind and understand how the process began. We started off with natural medicine and domestic care. Then we moved on to hospitals, which slowly started to get fancy equipment and MRI machines. But since then, nothing has really disrupted our healthcare system. This is inevitable, and it's already happening. Access to digital and modern healthcare will help get us through that bottleneck of limited resources that we are currently facing. I can imagine patients walking up in aisles in Walmart and Costco and picking up a $10 chip, depositing a sample on it, plugging it into their smartphone, and have the chip analyze the sample and tell them what the problem is. Instead of waking up at 3 a.m., going to the emergency department, waiting for hours, seeing a doctor who will end up telling you, you have a common cold, 
go home, sleep, take some rest, and drink some fluid. The chip would tell you right then and there that this is what you're suffering from. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying physicians or nurses right now are not providing a lot of value for us, or they're, they're going to get replaced at some point. On the contrary, this will just free them up to serve the more severe cases, reducing our waiting times immensely. And just over here in Waterloo, we are in the hub of innovation and disruption. There are dozens of life science companies working on incredible ideas that are capable of disrupting our healthcare system altogether. From our personal experiences, my co-founders and myself started working on NERV, a medical solution to combat some of these challenges. We started working on a medical device that can help improve a patient's outcome after a surgical procedure, reducing waiting times, overcrowded hospitals, and eventually leading to more staff being freed up. Now, the golden standard to identify post-operative complications includes keeping patients inside of hospitals in order to monitor their vital signs, identify if they're potentially developing a complication or not, and in some cases, running some laboratory investigations and doing some imaging just to make sure they're okay. And when all of these solutions fail, they end up going to re-operating on the patient once again in order to identify if a complication is happening or not. Imagine having to go through another surgery just to make sure you're okay. It is about time these conventional approaches get removed and replaced with newer ones that are capable of saving thousands of lives that are lost annually and billions of dollars that could be spent somewhere else. Now, let's walk through a process of how this would actually work. A patient would eventually get into the hospital. They would do their surgery. The patient would have a chip placed inside of their abdomen, which would help them identify if a complication is happening or not. And then if a complication does develop, the patient would get an alarm letting them know that they need to seek medical intervention while the physician would get a more detailed analysis on the complication that is happening. Research has actually indicated that treating a post-operative complication early on can help reduce thousands of dollars that are spent on treating the patient after, where in abdominal surgeries, in most cases, a patient could end up suffering a lot that the healthcare industry would have to spend over $100,000 just on that one patient. There were over 7,000 patients that went through a surgery, and around 400 suffered from a complication. It was identified that by getting the complications early on, they can reduce readmissions by around 70 readmissions, ICU days by over 270 days, and hospitalization days by over 4,000 days. Now let's do the math and add the numbers up. That's over $11 million in savings for just this one surgery and this one complication. Let's extrapolate that to all surgical procedures, all complications, and all medical problems that patients face in general, whether it be complications or not. How much in annual savings could we achieve? How many lives could we save? How much better would the quality of life be? But in order to achieve that, we need to admit to some inconvenient truth. As they say, Canadians are way too nice. And we're way too conservative. And we say, I'm sorry, way too much. Just, just saying. But on a more serious note, though, we need to get out of that bubble that we're living in. We live in a bubble where we're too afraid of liability, that we don't end up taking any risk. And outside of the comfort zone, is where all the magic happens at the end. But in order to drive progress in healthcare, we need to change it together. We all need to support entrepreneurs, believe in them. The government needs to take more initiatives to help bring technology to the market much faster. Physicians, hospitals, industry, investors, 
they all need to work collaboratively to support entrepreneurs. The medical staff need to focus on more engaging conversations where they're focused on the interests of their patients rather than their own. Patients and citizens need to get more involved. Voice your concerns. Do not let the norm be spend six hours in an emergency department to know what's wrong. Let's bridge the gaps between entrepreneurs and key decision makers to make our healthcare system better for everyone. Thank you.